Hello and welcome everybody to this webinar brought to you by Campaign in partnership with Bliss. I'm Omar Oaks, the Global Technology Editor for Campaign, and I'm delighted to be joined today by two impressive speakers. They are Alex Wright, Head of Insight at Bliss. Hello, Alex. Hi, Omar. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. And Francois Brugier, Brand Marketing Manager for Activia at Danone. Francois, hello. Hello. How's it going? Good. Thank you very much. So thank you all out there for joining. What are we going to be looking at today? So we humans are full of contradictions. That's why it's crucial for marketers to understand that what consumers are leaving behind them on the internet isn't necessarily a true and accurate picture of their real life habits and behavior. Our actions, what we actually do, speak louder than words and where we go tells the real consumer story. So focus, solely focusing on what people post on their social media profiles or what they might search for online gives advertisers a glimpse into their aspirational lives. But when marketers focus on these online signals, they can miss out on understanding their more impactful real life behavior. Physical signals, activity and behavior that we actually see in real life, they are the truest indicators of intent as they're much more telling about consumers' actual habits. Just because someone searches for a high-end car or looks at a movie review, it doesn't mean they will buy that car or go to the cinema. So this webinar in partnership with Bliss, who specialize in understanding real human behavior by analyzing vast quantities of mobile location data, this webinar will discuss and deconstruct how the world eats and shops in the run-up to this very busy holiday season using real-world intelligence to provide insights on the following areas. Primary versus secondary consumers, understanding audience segments and how products are being viewed. The path to purchase being an infinite loop, understanding real life is becoming increasingly important. Businesses need to work harder and engage and deliver the best experiences. And understanding the playing field. In the battle for consumer loyalty, sometimes the competition isn't who you think it is. So we'll dig into fast, how fast food brands can get a sense of audience loyalty and visit patterns across key regions to better identify and reach the right consumers. So, right, enough from me. Over the next hour or so, we're going to hear presentations from our speakers and we'll hear from you, the audience, to wrap up the sessions. So if any questions come to mind, please do submit them. We're going to have at least 15 minutes or so for questions at the end, hopefully a bit more if you have a bit more time. And you can post at any point during the webinar. Um, I'll get to as many as I can at the end of the session. So I promise now, without further delay, I'm going to hand over to Alex to get us started. Thanks, Omar. Um, there we are, uh, Omar, myself, and Francoise. Um, and as you said at the start, um, at Bliss, we analyze enormous amounts of mobile location data to give us a view on what human behavior is. So um, quite helpfully, um, behavior is predictable, um, which I think implicitly we all know. Um, we all are creatures of routine and habit and follow the path of least resistance, but that is part of the problem. If someone shows us a uh, least resistant path or an easier option, we can sometimes be inclined to take it. Um, so this uh, gentleman, Professor Barabasi, uh, quantified how predictable behavior is a few years ago. He analyzed hundreds of thousands of um, cell phone records across a number of major cities and found that 93% of our behavior is predictable. Um, which sadly only leaves about 12 hours to play with in the average week. So um, we're not quite as uh, spontaneous as an, and impulsive as we like to think, but that spontaneity is limited to our decision making. So just to illustrate that, um, and I appreciate some people might be on tif different time zones, so the, the lunch example might not resonate as well everywhere, but if I was to ask, are you going to have lunch today? Most people will say, yes, their behavior is predictable. But if I follow that up with what you're going to have, most people will answer, I don't know yet, because their decision making is unpredictable. It can be swayed, it can be influenced. And really working in advertising, that is the goal for all of us, to influence decision making. So behavior is predictable, decision making is not. And if it's not already clear, uh, this is a theme we're going to be coming back to a few times over the next 10 minutes or so. And brands that understand behavior are the ones who have the best chance of influence in decision making, um, which is extremely important, uh, particularly as we're operating now in an age of overwhelming choice. And 
I don't think this is unique to us or unique to this generation. I think every generation before us would have felt something very similar um, as the, the pace of life seems to go quicker than they can themselves. Um, but just a few stats to, to really illustrate this is that if we look at the UK over the space of the last generation, population's grown 14%. So reasonably fast, but not crazy. Um, in the US, it's about 30%. Australia, it's around 45, 50%. Um, and even in so Singapore, one of the other markets we operate in and, and looked at in the course of some of these recent studies, it's about 90% growth in that period. So even on the spectrum of growth, we're still looking at double digits, not quite triple digits. We then look at the expansion in the product range stocked in the average supermarket over this same time. It's leapt from 10,000 to closer to 40,000. So 300% growth in the products you're confronted with when you go around the supermarket. So it's not just a uh, fragmentation of um, product ranges that we've got to contend with as marketers, but also the channels that we're competing to try and achieve cut through, to try and identify audiences through and to get our products in front of them. And just taking this example of TV channels, so a um, traditional media type, um, where in the UK, in the right up to the late 90s, even the most early adopting households who got satellite or cable connections would have 10 commercial channels. Um, now, if you are signed up to these services, you got closer to 500. And that's before we even get onto the, the digital loom escape of all the uh, content platforms, publishers, devices you can access this stuff across. So there's been a real explosion in the sources of decision making influence, um, but also the decision to be made are getting that more, much more complex because at the point of purchase, you're confronted with so much more information. Which makes it very difficult for um, media planning. Uh, what used to be, you know, through the 50s, 60s, 70s, and so on, a very easily managed top down approach where content was dictated by a handful of powerful media moguls through platforms they implicitly understood, and each household were not overserved by them. You know, a household would have one TV. Things have changed a little bit now where everybody has. Um, a content access point in the palm of their hand, which means the whole paradigm has shifted and we've got to start planning from the bottom up, looking at the individuals. So start with the individuals and find the content that relates to them rather than starting with the content and operating on over-indexing behavior within that. So to come back uh, to the, the kind of the key tenet of this presentation is behavior is predictable, but decision-making is not. And the brands that understand behavior can have the best hope of influencing decision making. Um, and part of the challenge coming at this from a, from a data perspective, so a media, media planning strategy perspective, is that there is no single source of truth. Um, so I'm going to call on, a, you know, we could pick any number of oracles, but this one um, was far ahead of his time coming out with, with this gem in the 70s. Like many of the truths we cling to depend greatly on our point of view. We're all, uh, we operate on our own subjectivity. So our personal experiences, our biases uh, contribute to what we view as a source of truth. And the same can apply to media planning or understanding consumer behavior. So just using this um, diagram to illustrate the point, on the left-hand side, we have what is the worst case scenario. Um, so this phrase, alternative facts, was, was conjured up by the Trump administration a few years ago uh, in an effort to tell people black was white, um, despite photographic evidence to the contrary. Um, the, if we think getting to the extreme right-hand side is the best case scenario, um, this pure objective source of reality, it wouldn't really leave us any room for fun um, or interpretation or seeking competitive advantage if we all had this. So as long as we are pulling in different data sources, um, gathering objectivity, so through different data sources and diverse sources, this differentiates um, one player from another, it distances us from bias as well. So as long as we are not just relying on our own preconceptions and are aiming to get a more rounded version of the truth, the more sources we can bring on board, the better, as long as they're used appropriately, of course. Um, 
so forgive the, the slightly crude bucketing here, um, but broadly these data sources fall into three camps. So there's information we say. So typically this is the realm of traditional market research, whether that's quantitative survey data, qualitative focus groups, uh, that kind of thing. Um, then there is data we show. So, so this um, kind of the exhaust fumes on social media that are the output of what tends to be a, a very vocal minority um, but quite a polarizing set of feedback. So it's very rich, um, but has to be used carefully to be used appropriately. It can either be a, a string of highlights or a string of complaints. And I think we've got to be wary of the, the origins of the data, which is not to underplay how useful it can be. And in the third camp, uh, data, the do data, so observed data, so often passively collected objective data. Um, Mobile location falls into that camp, so what Bliss deal with, but it also includes things like first party store data, um, store card data, for example, where people will leave uh, an unequivocal trail of what their purchases are and when they made them and which store, but this can only apply to the stores that the store card belongs to um, and doesn't actually give us a view on people's consumer behavior outside that store or what the rest of their retail repertoire looks like or what the rest of their lifestyle in fact looks like so mobile location is is a valuable complement um, to any and or all of these sources um, which is not to elevate it above any of them i should want to be very careful to say that it's a a valuable complementary source and something that the the market is only really i think starting to get to grips with how useful it can be so we've got a few examples to to illustrate this uh, how we're applying this data um, in this example uh, looking at the automotive category we compare what people say to what people do um, the global web index is the source for this one um, if you look on the left hand chart uh, the brands which people would recommend it does not necessarily match up that closely to the brands they own or have previously owned. So personal experience is not the only thing influencing their recommendation of vehicles. Um, as a, a spin-off project to this, we actually looked at people's online behavior as well. So people viewing content related to specific car brands and ran a crossover study to see which of those devices viewing those content actually then went to visit the branded dealership and again we see quite a different picture between using online signals only versus the physical signals we see in people's actual behavior uh, second example here uh, data what we show versus what we do so this takes the top five quick service restaurant brands in the uk according to their number of twitter followers we see nando's way out in front in the lead and the comparison here is with um, foot traffic, so visits to each of these uh, quick service restaurants or coffee shops. I mean, I mean, it's it's clear to see there there is no relationship, and I think the correlation is actually a reasonably strong negative correlation. So the number of followers you have on social media is not necessarily always a clear indicator of your likely success when it comes to securing visits to your store. Um, and now I want to move on to um, a couple more case examples. Um, so last month we launched into the market a report on how the world eats, where we took four of our key markets, the UK, the US, Singapore and Australia, and tried to unpick um, the relationship and the interplay with some of the, the big global brands in the QSR sector. So three key learnings, um, or three key takeaways if you prefer, prefer puns. Um, the first one is that consumer crossover cuts across QSR segments. Um, so this is, you may be loyal to one named brand, but that does not mean you're exclusive to that kind of cuisine. So why we see KFC perform well overall, um, it's not necessarily the only chicken brand people will consume, but tends to be the leader in that category. But that won't preclude those visitors from visiting a burger restaurant or a sandwich shop. The second one is that there is a very, very clear relationship between population density and how well those audiences are served in that market. So there's almost a perfect correlation um, for a lot of QSR brands between the population of the cities they operate in and the number of restaurants they have there. But this is not just the QSR we look at. This is all their competitor QSRs as well. 
So a city tends to be served well in relation to its size. The more choice you have, the more competition there is, and that impacts on loyalty. The third point on here is that customers are seeking more variety and more convenience. And this is very interesting because this is where uh, a lot of the innovation seems to be happening in the, in the industry, whether that's tech related. Um, so installing in-store kiosks or ordering via app before you get there. It could be service or access. So some of the home delivery options that are now available in most markets, or, or it could be a broadening of the menu to try and lure new customers in. I know there's been a big move into the meat-free market for a lot of the major global QSR brands in the last 12 months. Um, so this snapshot from the How the World Eats study uh, from Bliss shows that even, that there's, even across these four markets, looking at the same global brands in each one, there's quite a difference in terms of um, people's preference and repertoire. So in Australia, burgers were the most popular choice um, out of when we looked at burgers, chicken, pizza, sandwich shops and other QSR, uh, which can include some of the healthier options or independent stockists. But to have only 20%, 28% as your top ranking number um, is much lower than in Singapore, where people, uh, about a third of the visits we saw were to other QSR, so healthier options, independent um, retailers, so this, uh, there's a big uh, skew towards street food uh, and local cuisine hawkers, hawkers in Singapore. In the UK, sandwiches, uh, predictably, um, to anyone listening in the UK, are probably our favourite option out of this. Oh, in fact, that's an interesting semantic point. They're not necessarily our favourite option, but they are the option we choose most frequently. So the brands, again, to echo the point I made a moment ago, brands we advocate for are not necessarily the brands that see the biggest share of spend from us. And in the US, uh, burgers are their go-to place with, with close to 40% visiting burger joints there. Um, as a spin-off from this, we've been doing a bit more in-depth work with, with one of these global QSR brands. And without giving too much away, um, I think their objectives are going to be shared across the whole category. Um, and not just the QSR category. They want to increase loyalty, they want to increase frequency of visit, and they want to broaden their audiences. Um, so first of all, if we're using our data to examine loyalty, the first thing we'd be interested to do is understand disloyalty. So that portion of the market that is not just visiting your restaurant or your chain of restaurants. Um, and the QSR sector is a particularly promiscuous one in this regard. So looking at two periods, we only see about one in six visit visitors return period on period, um, which is not bad in the category, um, but uh, something they would like to improve. So we're trying to understand what is driving disloyalty in the sector. And part of it is the opportunity for more consumption occasions. So this idea of increasing frequency, some QSR brands do a lot better than others because they cater to more mealtimes, more eating occasions. Breakfast is a big pull, whether that's food breakfast offering or drawing people in um, through a coffee product. Um, the other thing that uh, a few of these brands do very well is the fourth meal. Uh, depending on what, uh, what region you're dialing in for, I think some would call it the fourth meal or the second dinner or the post pub, um, whatever it will be. Catering to more eating occasions is a great way to drive frequency or at least pick up some share of visits from your competitors. And the final part about bringing new audiences in, um, a lot of the QSR sector was, was really anathema to anyone who led a vegan or vegetarian lifestyle until maybe 12 to 18 months ago. And all the QSRs really are falling over themselves to offer meat-free options and attract this new audience in. It's where growth is happening. A lot of money has been spent in the sector. And a lot of people are experimenting with this as a lifetime, lifestyle choice too. Um, and to finish off, um, just a couple of examples, and they are, I'm deliberately going to avoid them coming across too salesy, even though they are effectiveness products. But the idea that using this real world intelligence to drive real world results, I think, is, is important to include. Otherwise, it's just all hot air, really. Um, so this first one, and I'm aware that there, there may be a, a soft edge of hypocrisy here. There's, there's not supposed to be, but this is what people say. So this is an aggregate of... Um, close to 40 brand uplift studies conducted independently on our work. And what I'm not 
going to say here is that when bliss are on the plan, things work better than when they're not for the sake of it. But what I think is important to reference here is why we think it's working better. And so forgive how oversimplified it is as we go through awareness via consideration to purchase intent, but we can see very clearly that our performance improves the further through the funnel we get or the strength of relative strength of our performance improves. Um, and I think why it works, and it, it does pretty well at the top of the funnel already anyway, because we're using this real world intelligence to identify audiences and fill the funnel with people who are already demonstrating in market behavior. And if we're filling the funnel with those kind of audiences, it gives us a much better chance of holding on to them through the consideration stage. We see less leakage because if they're already active in your sector, there's a strong likelihood they're already aware of your brand, but if they aren't, they're aware of your competitors and will be aware of where to head to in the supermarket or what part of town to go to to visit your retailer. Um, but the real strength comes at the point of purchase intent. Um, and this is where mobile uh, bliss amongst the players in, in the mobile sector um, perform quite well when it's combined with broadcast channels. So we let broadcast do the heavy lifting, drive the top of mind awareness. But then what mobile can do is pick up the baton when there is a de decision making moment imminent. So while behavior is predictable, which is what we're filling the funnel with, we resurface the brand when the decision making moment is imminent. And that is what is driving the greater performance when it comes to purchase intent. And that, of course, is what people say, which is one data source, very valid data source. Um, but what people do um, is equally important. Um, what we can see consistently uh, across, and this is um, independent measurement from IRI, so looking at the FMCG and pharmaceutical sector. So a selection of studies we've, we've worked with in that category. And we can see that when we implement real world intelligence and drive incremental visits to store, that delivers a consistently positive um, story in terms of driving return on investment. And that's how real world intelligence drives real world results. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Alex. That was very interesting indeed. And for anyone out there wondering, um, he did all of that complete without notes, which is very impressive indeed. Um, before I move on to Francois, I just want to um, introduce our first poll question. And everyone out there, please answer this. We're really interested to know what is the biggest challenge that you face? And we'd like you to choose from the following options, building customer loyalty, increasing frequency of purchase, or reaching new audiences that question is what is the biggest challenge you face and do remember if you have any questions for our panelists at the end please do post them as soon as possible now francois over to you all right thank you very much um so what i'm going to be talking about today is a brand called uh, light and free that we launched um in the uk and uh, that is a brand new comer to the Danone portfolio. And the reason why I'm gonna be talking about this brand is um, the fact that it was built entirely here um, and it was based on behavior and how um, that behavior affects decision-making. I think this is where this study is gonna be quite relevant with the conversation we had before. Um, our business is mainly in yogurt and a couple of years ago we were having some issues. Um, part of those issues were the fact that yogurt relevance um, had been declining for years. Um, when we asked people, um, only 20% of them actually said that it had a positive impact on their health. And as shockingly low as that number is for a, a healthy category like ours, it was actually declining and at a very, very rapid rate. So what we um, what we saw on top of that was the fact that the light segment, uh, which we also affectionately call the diet segment, um, was in dear need of uh, growth. Uh, it had lost 40% of its sales in eight years. And in spite of that, it was still 15% of the overall market. So we needed to find a way to bring something to life that would actually make the light segment relevant again. And what we saw really was uh, an opportunity for us um, and the diet segment was really uh, rooted in old shoppers. And when we saw those older shoppers, um, they were starting to leave that segment. And we could decide that we were gonna try to be as relevant as possible uh, with them and you know, look at some classic um, barriers and triggers and how can we address with our current products what they're lacking. 
or we could just say, forget about that. Um, we've actually noticed that millennials aren't eating as much yogurt as our other age groups, and there's something behind that, and we need to understand why that is and why we can make this quite relevant with a target that is currently not really shopping inside the category. And what we did uh, for that is we kind of reversed the say, show, and do funnel that we saw earlier. Um, we decided to study millennials in a fairly revolutionary way, which means basically just watching them. Um, we could have asked them a lot of stuff. We're very good in marketing at, um, you know, just uh, asking questions, asking for purchase intent, building concepts, uh, and then validating instinct immediately on, on, on data. What we figure out, and especially in the diet segment, which is, you know, very much about weight, it's very much about appearance, um, which means that people generally answer based on what they want to project and what necessarily what they actually want to do. Um, so what we did there was we actually just wanted to look at them, watch their behavior, and see how they were going to react and see how they were going to behave. Um, and <clears throat> sorry, just bringing back old Obi-Wan Kenobi here because there's never too much Obi-Wan Kenobi in a, in a presentation. Um, but the reason why we didn't do declarative is because they're not the insights we were looking for. Um, the insights we were looking for were very strongly rooted in consumer behavior, deep consumer understanding of why they were purchasing things, why they were behaving certain ways, um, why they were choosing different products one over the other, but also how they were interacting with media um, and how that affected their different um, <clears throat> models in the passive purchase. So what we noticed after doing that is the fact that, well, first, um, contrarily to what we saw earlier in terms of yogurt, people are actually have never been as much obsessed about health than they are today. Um, two thirds of the people actually take care of their health today. They do it actively. Um, and we know that naturally healthy packaged foods are growing at a much faster rate than any other category of food. The second thing that we learned is um, in terms of dieting, and it was a very strong insight, was the fact that um, deprivation dieting was basically dead. Um, you know, the old Kate Moss model of going on a scale, uh, reaching a target weight is, we don't hear about that anymore. And if you just try to go back to four or five years ago, that's, that's basically how people were taking care of their weight. Um, <clears throat> but we realized that that entire mindset had actually shifted to a very active and positive approach to weight management. It means um, not just running on an empty treadmill, but actually, um, you know, doing classes with your friends, whether it's picking up kickboxing or um, spinning or any kind of those activities. Um, the second thing that we learned by looking at them, and this is something we probably could have asked but didn't realize how important it was um, until we just basically sat down and looked, was the fact that um, that generation is very, very highly educated on ingredients in their food. And they're very well educated on hidden ingredients particularly. And they had made sugar their number one enemy. Um, to the point that at that time, we just started to see that trend coming up, but nowadays you get 92% of the population that is actually concerned about sugar consumption. And the last thing that we observed was the fact that they were looking for trust and authenticity cues in the brands that they were choosing. They're looking for transparency. They're looking for authenticity. Um, there's a sort of candid relationship that they want to have with their brands and the products that they buy. So with all of that, when we looked at this entire package, what we decided to do was to actually launch a new brand called Light and & Free. Um, and when we realized the entire projection about dieting and how that had changed um, and how it had evolved into a much more holistic weight management approach, uh, we basically decided to launch it as a true lifestyle brand rather than launching it as your typical um, diet low-calorie brand. So the first thing that we did was uh, first build quite disruptive packaging that was based on trust and authenticity cues. Um, so you'll have some matte finish packaging, uh, off-white as a finish, but also kind of wanted that vibrancy that come with the active and positive lifestyle um, to come through with some pretty vibrant colors. We made it as well very playful, uh, inside printing, cute accessories, um, 
that really brought the brand personality to life. And the formula that we put inside was uh, quite revolutionary at the time. And if you go on a UK shelf today, you'll realize how many no added sugar claims you find. Uh, but at the time, we came out with that formula and kind of changed how things were doing. Now, in order to reach millennials, um, the second thing that we did was to decide to launch as a digitally native brand. Uh, barely any television, uh, more so to um, just generate some reach. But in order to um, reach that target, we really hit hard on social and digital. And this is an important part because as much as the insights between, behind dieting, weight management, are very important to not get from a declarative perspective, um, the image that you or what you consume online is, on the contrary, very much about your projection and that image that you want to project or that you are attracted to. And as a result, the communication that we started doing um, really went in that uh, in that uh, in that direction. Um, so what we started doing was actually leveraging some of their favorite passions and some of their favorite brands to partner with, um, because basically that was going to get us a seat at the table to be relevant with that generation of people. The first passion point that we activated um, was music, um, and we started partnering with Spotify to bring that to life. We organized some secret uh, concerts with the Kooks, uh, for example, in London. Um, and uh, only invited uh, 50 people or 50 winners to participate to those um, concerts. Um, and that was fairly relevant. And all this package brought together was incredibly successful from a sales perspective. Um, if you look at all the innovations that launched in 2016 across the categories, Light and Free was the number one innovation, um, beating out some of the pretty big players that you see. And that's by being on shelf only half of the year. And we, when we look at this success internally, the way we look at it isn't necessarily um, just from a pure business standpoint. It's also from a ways of, of working and ways of looking at things. And the fact that we decided to not basically validate our instincts quantitatively, but really start by observing true human behavior and then building a brand on top of that and only then validating what we had learned uh, with quantitative data. Um, the trial we had on the brand was absolutely amazing. Um, we had 15% penetration in the first 12 months. Uh, more than 4 million people had tried Light and Free in that time. Um, and pretty much all of the volume and value that we had was incremental to the business. 70% um, of those sales were sales we uh, sourced them that were additional to the portfolio. Uh, and at the same time, um, we managed to command a strong price premium because of our relevance with people. And after that, we also kept activating the brand. Um, so we also activated art and design as another part, uh, as another passion point, sorry, uh, by doing an artist collaboration. So I'll share with you just a couple of the designs that we did, but uh, at least in the yoga category, this is pretty disruptive and really not the way we're used to doing things. Um, so partnered with some of these guys and decided again to really bring it back to life from um, a digital standpoint, working with Spotify, Snapchat, um, and all of those channels. And uh, just to finish on results, um, we managed to actually double um, the sales from our, our launch year in 2017. And we're now about to close 2019, and we're still looking at um, high double-digit growth on this brand. And just to reemphasize what I was saying earlier, um, it's really linked to the fact that we started with the premise that we didn't just have a big drawer of consumers that all fit in the same bucket, uh, but the fact that we wanted to understand um, those human beings, um, how they behaved, and how that influenced their purchase behaviors. Thank you. Great, Francois. Thanks very much for that. Very interesting. Um, I was wondering, just an, as a general question, do you think um, it's it's gotten easier or harder um, based on the things you were saying in terms of this this gap between how people actually behave and what you know social media data and otherwise would say about them? Do you think it's gotten harder or easier in recent years? Um, well, that's a tricky question, <laughs> um, but I'd say um, it's it's gotten a little bit 
um, better. Uh, in general, or it's gotten easier for us to 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 relive. Also, because there's a the lines are a little bit less or more blurred than they were before. Um, so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think there's a little bit more consistency between um, reality and projection um, than there used to be. Uh, mostly because uh, a lot of people are have seen through that over the years. If you uh, take a look at what influencers have brought to social and digital, for example, uh, I'd say a lot of people are now seeing past that and it's becoming a little bit more authentic. Mm, yeah, so it's a really interesting idea that I think is going to develop in the coming years, this um, discontinuity um, between um, our social media selves and our real world selves. Um, great. Um, we're getting lots of answers to our poll. Um, we're going to give you one minute just to answer that. What is the biggest challenge you face? And remember, um, you can respond to that um, just by answering below the video player. We'll get to re the results very shortly. Um, we're going to open it up to the Q&A. So please um, do, if you have any questions, just pop your answer in there. We'll get through as many as possible. There are quite a few to get through already. Um, so be quick. Um, firstly, um, from Vaughan Edmonds, who is a planner at Sense London, um, I guess an interesting question, how do you watch enough people to make your insights representative for an entire demographic? Um, Alex, do you want to take that one? Yeah, uh, good question. And th this tends to be one of the first questions we get asked quite a lot. And I think it's, it, it originates from um an ongoing uh reliance on traditional uh, traditional data sources traditional methods of research so the we don't actually sample our data um what we see uh, and there are a variety of different ways different mobile location players collect this data or harvest the data um, is when people are active on their devices and on any of the apps we have access to for advertising purposes um which is lots uh, we see billions of data points every day um, we get access to in the background of that ad space part of the information is the latitude longitude of that device so their gps signal so in what well, in the average a typical month in the uk we might see 25 to 30 million devices so it's not a sample per se but the volume we're seeing um, it makes for pretty robust indications well very very, very robust indications of behavior. Um, and what we are trying to move away from, and I suppose trying to steer the in industry slightly away from as well, is is the ongoing reliance on demographic targeting. Um, I think like Francois alluded to some of it in, in his presentation there, is that the age you are is, is no longer a, a strong enough predictor of what your behavior is going to be. For some products in some categories, absolutely it might be. Um, but for a, a lot of the, the products and a lot of the categories, your age or your gender um, may provide an over-index for behavior. But actually, if we can just behave, start with the behavior, the target behavior in the first place, we can cut that step out and have a much higher hit rate. Okay. All right. Um, Going to answer the poll question now. Your answer is revealed, and I can tell you, oh, we've got a huge winner here. The, uh, the question was, what is the biggest challenge you face? An overwhelming majority, 8 out of 10 of you, think that reaching new audiences is the biggest challenge you face in comparison to increasing frequency of purchase or increasing customer loyalty. Um, Francois, what do you think of that? Would that be an answer that you anticipate? Uh, I'm part of the 20%. Um, wow. to, to me, it's um, um, we get in stages, especially with the amount of choice, and, and we are in a category that is fairly promiscuous. Um, so for us, um, driving driving frequency is probably the toughest challenge, more so than loyalty. Um, that's where our, our, our biggest challenge would be. Um, reaching new consumers is, is something we have gone um, quite used to, uh, I'd say, even in um, a media model era that has completely changed the way that we talk to people. Um, but definitely trying to make sure that we, we increase that frequency is, is always a bigger challenge for us. Okay, thanks very much. 
Right, it's Q&A time, guys. Get your questions in. We've got lots already, but um, hopefully we'll get to all of them. Um, first one here um, is an interesting one from James Cook. Hello, James. He does marketing comms for the CCCU. Um, James asks, what I'm interested in is what one thing would you do starting today in terms of understanding consumer behavior and then putting what you learn into practice, especially with a limited budget? Um, I guess maybe Francois, I'll go to you first. I mean, Dan on, maybe not such a limited budget, but, <laughs> but um, I'm sure you can emphasize. What one thing would you do? Yeah. Um, no, we're definitely not limited in budget, but there's um, a thinking that is going on a lot um, in our world, which is, you know, try to think a lot more like a startup and try not to just think like your budget will solve everything. Um, <clears throat> there's always a quote that, that I love when we do... Um, when we do insights training, which is, you know, if you want to see how a lion hunts, don't go to the zoo, go to the jungle. Um, it, it's just, you have to go out there. You have to just watch people, what they do, what's coming uh, out in trends, uh, try to understand why that is happening. Um, and, and then you can find clever ways of, of scaling that understanding. But it really goes back to, you know, watching people, talking to people, and, and actually trying to get as far away as possible from that testing environment, which will create the bias that you are, um, that you want to avoid by basically either putting them in a room or, you know, asking questions that are leading to the answers you want to hear. Um, that's a really interesting point. I want to pick up with Alex, actually, this point about buyers, um, whether it's polling or whether it's marketing surveys, whether it's data-led um, um, surveys, there's always this question of buyers. I write quite a lot about artificial intelligence and the problems with buyers is that creep into that as well. Firstly, is there any way to avoid buyers when you do these sorts of surveys or is it just something we have to accept and mitigate some other way um so there are another a number of means of mitigating for it and that's like the medical science field has has done a lot of this to try and eradicate false positives and those kinds of phenomenon i think from a this i suppose slightly less scientific media research side of things it's important for us to or the, probably the most important thing we can do is try and have a greater understanding of the origins of the data and therefore the reality that it might be susceptible to some of these things. Because even if people's responses are shaped by cognitive bias, like whether that's social proofing or, or like Francoise was saying, people, they are projecting an image of themselves that is maybe not, not quite a true reflection of reality. As long as we're taking some consideration for what people's motivations are for giving those answers, that doesn't render the source invalid. Um, and uh, of course, it's slightly, it's always difficult to understand exactly what those motivations are. But I think that brings us back to this point of pulling in a diverse range of different data sets to try and give you the most rounded answer to the questions you're trying to answer. There is no one source that can answer all of this. Um, I think it was it was it was great to hear Francois talk through the fact that they used a variety of sources, whether it was the the ethnographic side or the scale up through quant to you know, try and understand the size of the potential market. All of these sources and approaches have different applications at different stage of um, a marketing plan or media schedule creation. Mm. Um, I don't know if this. If is I can just um, sorry, sorry, if I could on. just. Put on that, uh, to me, it is very important um, to understand how the data has been compiled and how it has been built, um, because we'll always rely on data, obviously, and actually we're probably relying on data more than we ever had. It's, it's really understanding how that data comes through and what is the bias that you are looking at it with. So you can then respond to the different questions that you have, um, but we'll always have to obviously rely on scale as much as possible. It, it's really acquiring those different p bits and pieces of knowledge and then trying to combine them in a way that, that starts making sense. 
And what's your view, Francois, specifically on AI? Do you think, um, do, are you attracted or maybe you've already um, started testing and using um, machine learning in order to, to, to gather insights and perhaps, you know, machines can understand things about us that maybe we don't even realize about ourselves? Um, <clears throat> yeah, we're, we're starting to dip our toes into that. I wouldn't say it's, um, it's something that we, that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and it can be in, an incredibly powerful um, as a tool. Uh, let's not kid ourselves. There's, there are things that we can learn that I would never learn otherwise, um, it, particularly when it, it comes to trends. Um, you know, we work in food, uh, so flavor mapping, what's coming, what's next. Um, more so than, than I'd say deep human insights. Uh, we just have to know what we want to use that or what we want to use AI for rather than just turn to AI by default or trying to use it to answer every single question that we have. Okay. Yeah. I, th I think from this side, I'd, I'd concur with, with an awful lot of that. I think it's very new and very interesting and I think most of us are still figuring out how best to use it but we are we do work in an industry that is obsessed with novelty um, so we are figuring out as we go and there will be mistakes as we go along but it's been the same for every other source that has dropped on dropped into our lap in the in, in the intervening period I think it's it's great for doing a lot of the heavy lifting uh, a lot of the number crunching I appreciate that it's probably more on the machine learning than, than pure AI side of things. Um, and also maybe it's, it's a, a bit of a personal crusade of mine, I suppose, to differentiate between what information is and what insight is. And I think machine learning and artificial intelligence is, is incredible for the information filtering, gathering, curation, um, cleansing process. But I still do think you need uh, a human lens to to try to appreciate what the the key insight will be in each scenario. Okay, very interesting indeed. Um, we are of course heading towards the holiday season, and we've got a question here that's um, talking in particular to that. Um, and I, I suppose this is one for both of you, but maybe Alex, you could kick off. What does analysis of buying trends in the lead up to the holiday season in particular show or tell us about consumer shopping habits? And I, I suppose, what does it not tell us? Uh, I think, well, interesting. I th was it, is it Niels Bohr, his, his quote or something saying that the, the difficulty about predicting the future is that it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> um, so we, we did have um, a few studies we ran last year um, to kind of give us a, a little bit of context for what we might see this year. Um, so looking at, uh, I suppose we'll, we'll start in November, we, look, we looked at Black Friday um, and what we saw was, was a largely positive store for the retailers who'd be pursuing it. Um, probably a picture that conforms to a lot of what everyone's common sense would expect to be the case. Electrical stores saw an uplift in footfall, clothing retailers saw an uplift in footfall. Um, but that uplift in footfall was fairly soft because it started, it basically spread um, at least seven days prior to Black Friday actually coming. So there's, there's the Grey Friday, which I think is a proper thing. I think that's what a lot of people call it. Um, the week before, when a lot of brands try and um, jump the gun and get an advantage in the race. Right. But what was uh, interesting from our point of view on this is that while those retailers saw an uplift in footfall, some of the service sector outlets that surround them, so the coffee shops, the restaurants, didn't see an increase in footfall in that period as well so it was almost like shopping was was maybe a more focused activity rather than it being part of a casual retail experience um so that was looking at um a, a range of town centers across the country we also looked at the grocery sector um because we we work with a lot of grocery clients and so just for our own interest we looked at the difference between november and december uh, in terms of share of footfall to the uk's grocers and somewhat disappointingly i think we saw almost an identical picture between november and december and i think a few of the, the grocers were a bit disappointed in seeing that as well you know they all go big on their christmas campaigns trying to to drive people into store but the truth is that 
analysing a four week period in the grocery retail sector is long enough for everybody to visit every store they're possibly going to and exercise every option they have in their repertoire. The, the flip side of that that was interesting was that the promiscuous portion of shoppers, so the ones that have the wider repertoire, potentially got, well, not potentially, the, the data showed us, they got even more promiscuous in the run up to Christmas. So almost, I suppose, linking back to one of the points in the in the deck at the beginning, is that if we want to try and under, understand loyalty, first we need to un, unpick disloyalty and understand it from that perspective. We've done a bit more recently in the, the clothing sector, um, particularly um, one of my colleagues in the US has, has examined this in some depth. And what she found was that uh, the US tend to dress sports casual. So if we bucket retailers into those two categorizations, sports and casual, their proportion of stores pretty much matches their proportion of footfall driven through them. But stores operating in the discount sector or the vintage sector, the luxury sector in the more sustainable clothing sector. So those at the ends of the normal distribution spectrum are the ones they're seeing almost twice the volume of footfall we would predict given their relative store count. So there is growth in the market and it's happening at the ends. Um, and this kind of fragmentation, I think, is happening across a lot of retail as the, the kind of, I suppose, big retail that grew through the last few decades on the back of mass consumerism is starting to falter in a lot of developed markets. So I'd, I'd expect this is a trend we'll see continuing, a decentralization of consumerism. Mm. That's, that's quite interesting, given um, the sectors you mentioned as well. Um, but Francois, with regards to Danone and the products um, that you sell, I mean, do, do you do you find that's true for you as well, the, the seasonality? Um, or is it something all year round? We have some some seasonality on our end, obviously. Uh, but I'd say the, the holiday season for us is... It, is where um, our sales go downwards. Um, so I, I wouldn't necessarily know how um, how I can answer that question relevantly on my end. Um, that's okay. I want to get to um, this next question um, from Rhys Merrifield, who's a planning manager in Ocean in the UK. Um, do you think social media data will become less and less effective due to people's online and offline selves? And I suppose it becomes even more interesting when you think about the changes that the social media um, companies themselves, you know, Facebook is, you know, um, ostensibly becoming more privacy conscious, more group focused, less open. Um, people are more aware of social media in various ways. They're, they're using it differently. Um, do you think... Um, this discon discontinuity will will grow or will get smaller. What do you think, Alex? Oh, I'll, I'll probably jump on one of uh, the last points Francois made in his his is that um, authenticity is creeping in. Um, I think people, especially younger generations coming through, are very very sensitive to anything that rings kind of bullshit alarm bells. Um, and brands are having to cotton onto this, and some of them are really struggling to deliver authenticity in an authentic way. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how social media performs in that regard, or, or how it evolves in that regard. I think, it, it, I mean, it falls into the camp of people experimenting with new ways of communicating um in a big way. I mean, the, the Fire Festival is a, a great and very entertaining example probably for everybody who didn't buy a ticket. Um, yeah, the, the way that was presented versus the reality, I think seemed to be um, a, a tipping point in people saying like, enough is enough in terms of nonsense online. Um, even the kind of, I suppose, the, the worst or the most vapid end of influencer culture um, is, is coming to a close as well. So I suppose, a positive sign could be increasing authenticity online um maybe the less sensationalist angle is that with improved authenticity and more truth it becomes almost less interesting no, not less useful but maybe less interesting and is then that data something you could gather through other sources mm. Okay. Um, one for you, Francois. How can brands ensure they are targeting consumers who feel the brand is relevant to them? How can brands do this on a global scale? 
um, we we try to make it as granular as possible, uh, which almost goes um, against being global, really. Um, and, and the way we think about activating brands here, we you know we have some brands um, uh, like Activia, for example, that operates in dozens and uh, of countries. But we, the way we activate it is by trying to not just find insights that are relevant in a specific country, but what kind of the insights that will be relevant for specific tribes, um, what makes them connected. And following that is talking to these different tribes, um, almost regardless of um, geographical barriers. Um, but the idea is to go small before going big. Right. Okay. We've got about five minutes left. Last chance. If you've got any questions, um, please pop them on there right now. Um, just take this one. Um, in your presentation, Alex, um, you talked a lot about fast food brands and um, you called them QSRs. Remind me what QSR stands for. Sorry. Yes. Quick service restaurants. Is quick. A, yeah. Diplomatic way of calling fast food restaurants. Right. Right. Burger joints and the rest of it. Yep. Um, so fast food brands, um, how can they use data to increase customer loyalty? Maybe, maybe first off by starting to explain um, why you focus particularly on that sector and then move on to how can they actually use data to increase loyalty? Um, so the QSR sector is, is very interesting to us. It's, ju it's just one of the sectors we cover. Um, so I, I suppose from a business point of view, automotive is very big, QSR is big, FMCG and grocery and retail in general um, is big. But it, it's a great category for us to look at because it's a very mainstream behavior. A lot of people do it. A lot of people do it often. There are loads of options in the market. Um, and it, it's a market that is evolving in a very interesting way as well. I probably didn't linger on it long enough in the deck, but the idea that um, the most popular cuisine in Singapore were none of the branded restaurants um, is quite telling. And, and something I wouldn't be surprised to see play out um, in in more Western markets as well, as people, I think, are moving away from the big brand experience. So maybe what those brands bring in trust, they lack in experience um, quite often. Um, so with Singapore being an incredible melting pot community that it is, we see the very same things happening in pockets of London or pockets of New York or pockets in, in California as well where there is a diverse population and people are seeking different options, the category is getting turned on its head. And even with that, um, the US retail example, I said where the, the growth is happening at the edges of the spectrum, I think the same is happening in the QSR sector. So while all the established brands are kind of scrapping to, to corner this growing meat-free audience, are they missing threats that are occurring elsewhere where it's about experience, not just the menu range? I think the, for, to actually to, to go back to what your actual question was, rather <laughs> than rambling around it, the, the, the challenge to increase customer loyalty can't all come from opening new stores, which I think is, is the way the category evolved over the last few decades. Mm -hmm. By you open a new store, you become more convenient for a new group of people. So you give yourself a greater chance of being visited. And once they're visiting, then you can start to focus on driving loyalty. But a lot of these brands, and it's something they're, they're working to turn around now and have been over the last couple of years, but like a lot of the big FMCG brands and, and Francois, you'll probably find this as well. There is a, a dearth of first party data on the people who, do, who exhibit this behavior. Um, there are loyalty cards. I think even in the... Uh, the Twitter followers versus store visits example, Nando's is far and away um, has the most followers, but far and away has the fewest restaurants. Mm, mm. So how are they managing to get such a fervent digital following when all those people can't possibly be actually visiting the stores? They've, they've generated a sense of loyalty, maybe without the action of loyalty. Mm. So again, different sources are providing a different perspective on exactly the same scenario. Does that ring true for you, Francois, in terms of how you use data to try and increase customer loyalty? 
Um, well, yes, definitely. When when we're talking first party data for for massive FMCG brands, um, we're trying to leverage that. I'd say we're still in the early phases where, you know, we start needing almost to to, to start data mapping every piece of information that we have because in, when you're a large FMCG, you we have I'd say almost too much data uh, that we know what to do with it today. Um, and the first piece for us is is kind of cleaning all of that and understanding how we can best leverage it. Um, the we're in a category that has not a huge amount of emotional um, drivers of purchase. Um, it's a fairly rational category. So first party data, for example, to drive loyalty is not necessarily something that we rely on too much these days. Um, but there are opportunities for us to, to dig a little bit more into that and actually making something more tangible in the future. Okay, um, I can see it's just reached two o'clock, so we're out of time, I'm afraid. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for your questions. Um, I hope you found this session useful. I certainly have myself. Um, thank you so much to our speakers, Francois and Alex, taking part and sharing their expertise. Thank you to our audience. Thank you out there for listening and participating. Thanks to our sponsors, Bliss, for partnering with us. Um, we're all gonna go out after this and visit one of those QSRs I keep hearing about. Um, thank you everyone and see you next time for the next webinar. Bye-bye.